Hello everyone, welcome to the joint session of DNSSD and Snack. So DNSSD will cover the first 45 minutes of the session um, and then we'll move on to Snack. Um, so I'm Chris Box, next to me on my left is David Skinnerzy. Um We are the chairs of DNSSD. You can introduce <laughs> Darren is on my right. Um, <laughs> Mystery for 45 minutes. <laughs> so as usual, this is uh, an ITF session which is covered by the note well. Um, if you haven't read this, you, you should read it. It basically describes all of the um, information, all the rules that you agree to by participating in the ITF. Um, so you should be aware of that. Um, we, we don't have a volunteer for taking notes. Uh, thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Stuart is very good at taking notes. Thank you. Um, and, uh, for, because of this, this is a joint session. We haven't run a, um, joint session with snack before. Um, these, the links for this are a little different. So, um, the, the note taking button does take you to the notes file for snack, but we will put the DNSSD notes in there as well. Um, and of course it's integrated meet echo chat as well. So these are our useful links for reference. Um, what's different in this case is that the meeting materials are, are of course the snack link there. Um, as usual, DNSSD uses GitHub. We have an organization, which is where we keep our working group documents. Um, and those are listed there. And you can also always contact the chairs if you want to put um, a non-working group document there that you're working on. So this is our proposed agenda. So we're gonna start with uh, multiple queue types, um, then move on to SRP, advertising proxy, SRP replication. Um, and then uh, TSR followed by um, additional. Any requests to modify that? If not, we can crack on. So Ray, do you wanna come up while I find the slides? Yep. Yeah, I'll take it. Cross. Uh, maybe do you want clicker? Would you like the clicker? What do you uh, yeah. say next slide? I really don't know if I should see my slides, but I guess I can look around. Oh, is oh. Uh, I'll contact me, Deco. Right. Okay. Well, there's not many others. Um, can we come up? I guess there are lots of those there. No. Okay. Um, somehow I'll try and see what I've been doing without being able to see my slides very well. Uh, this is a very, very old draft. I first wrote it, I think, about 12 years ago, back when DNSX still existed. Um, hopefully, you've seen it because it's um, been adopted as a working group draft. Uh, this is a solution to the issue of how do you actually get multiple uh, record types back from the DNS within a single query. 
Uh, I have a related draft in DNS Op, currently in Working Group Last Call, um, which clarifies that trying to set the QD count field of a DNS query to more than one is really not a viable solution. So this draft, which has ended up here, uh, proposes an alternate solution to that. So yeah, well, the draft status is, yeah, it's a working group draft, uh, which was adopted shortly after the last physical meeting. Um, I sent a fairly long email to the group back on 5th December um, with a summary of some of the off-list discussions that have been had both uh, yeah, in person and um, on the DNS op working group where there have been some discussion on this draft. Uh, there are a few points on um, there that need some technical clarification. Um, there are some where my own assessment was that there was no consensus. Yeah, a few people proposed a few ideas and nobody else could support those ideas. So I said in that document, that I, should, I, I proposed there was no further action on those. So we've got a question then to the working group, which I guess we'll have to respond to the, uh, to the email is, are we actually happy that, with my proposal to basically take no further action on those? Um, Chris Box sent me some uh, editorial changes just a couple of days ago. Um, because they are merely editorial, they're not going to the working group for approval. It's basically just, yeah, because yeah, they're, they're not changing anything substantive. So they're within my editorial remit to actually get those in. Uh, those are in the GitHub repository, but they haven't yet resulted in a Dasho one being published. So there were, this is the first of two issues that are on the technical design of the EDNS auction um, that's been proposed. Um, sorry, I should ask, uh, are people here not familiar with what this draft actually tries to do? Or people who are familiar with what the draft tries to do? Oh, I, know, so I know the DNS heads know what the draft is trying to do. I assume um, that there's always someone who's not familiar. Yeah, okay, so maybe I'll do a quick recap then, because I assume everybody actually knew what we were trying to do. Um, also, a normal DNS question, you get one record type in the question. Um, so you might be asking for an A record or a quad A record, and that's what you'll get back. Um, but there are some optimizations to be had, particularly on low bandwidth networks, um, where you might want to say, well, actually, can you give me both the A record and the quad A record, maybe even the HTTPS record now, all in one request? And rather than issue three separate queries, uh, this provides a method using an eDNS option where the eDNS option actually includes the additional queue types that you'd like the server to answer for. And uh, this is particularly designed for the case where all of the questions have the same owner name, the question, the domain name that you're actually trying to look up. Um, so if you're at www.example.org, you can get the A record and the quad A and the HTTPS record all in one go. Um, but if the option is not supported, then there is still the primary queue type in the initial question, and that's the record we'll get back. And then if the server didn't support this feature, the client can then go back and ask explicitly for the other ones. Uh, so there is a fallback and it's all completely backwards compatible. So that's the general idea. So the current design has a, uh, a, a single bit uh, within the DNS option code that says whether this is a query or a response. It's similar to the, um, uh, essentially the direction bit in the DNS header itself. And the reason that exists is because there are unfortunately a bunch of uh, uncompliant um, DNS systems out there where if they receive an eDNS option, they don't process it, but they'll just echo the option back instead and uh, without modifying that in any way. So the idea of the direction bit was to uh, basically allow the client that sent the query to be able to tell the difference between a server which has recognized the query and processed it from one that has simply echoed back the data without processing the data at all. Um, because the client does need to know whether the data it's got back is semantically valid or whether it's just simply missing. Um, there had been a suggestion from Stuart Cheshire um, that it may be simpler to simply uh, use two EDNS option codes instead, one for the request and one for the response. Um, I'm personally completely ambivalent on that. Um, yeah, um, but basically put it to the working group to see is there actually a preference, do we care? Uh, I, I don't think there's anything to much to be said in either way, so it's really Hobson's choice. Yeah, both work. Ted. From an implementation perspective, it seems marginally easier to do two option codes, but yeah. Yeah, there's, there's really almost nothing in it, yeah. I think, yeah. 
Um, so and reminder to state your name at the mic and join the meet at Goku. You know the deal, Ted. Ted Lemon, sorry. It, I, I've been around so long, I forget these things. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh, so I'd ask the working group members who actually care about this to go back and review the email I sent back on 5th December and say whether you have a preference. Um, there, but there's a related question, which is the second technical one, because both of these fields fit into the same arc set of the uh, EGNS option code, where I have specified that there is currently a three-bit field, so the range of zero to seven, or in practice, one to seven, uh, which says how many additional Q types are there embedded within the message. Um, the reason it's kind of related is that if we don't put this field in, actually the server can figure it out anyway because of the length of the option field. Um, but conversely, if we don't put it in, then the limit on how many options, sorry, how many Q-types can be specified isn't constrained at all and could only be constrained by the specification. So for example, the, the RFC could say, yeah, thou shalt not put in more than seven of these. Um, but then that's a, um, if you like, that's a, that's a, it's a technical requirement, it's a functional requirement that's only actually written in text and not actually constrained on the wire. Um, it's again, swings and roundabouts. Um, but both the QT count field and the QT direction field both fit in the same octet at the moment. So yes, there is a theoretically simpler design where the option field literally just has two bytes to say, yeah, it's going to be a quad A record and, an, and another two bytes to say an HTTP re record. Or you have the count field and then the server can do a bit more validation on the, uh, has Stuart joined the queue? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't want to waste time fussing with this, but I will. Um, State your name is what you will do. <laughs> I'm Stuart Cheshire from Apple, and I have a very quick comment because I think we agree that we're, we're all happy doing it either way. The reason I made the comment I did is just, it makes me nervous when you have two ways of expressing the same thing that might be in conflict. And if the option length is a certain length, but the three bit length filled within it, is more than that, then that's an error. Yes, and then and you return to, a form error. And, and, then, and then we have to specify, do, do you use what's there and ignore the excess? Do you reject the whole thing as format error? Do you forget to do either of those things and now you have a buffer over on security bug? So uh, that's just a general protocol design principle that anytime you have two fields that have to be in agreement and it's an error if they're not, that's extra code handling the errors and extra thinking about how you're going to handle the errors. And if you just don't have the two fields in conflict, now you can't have an error. The, the option is what it is, well, and you just interpret it. Yeah, uh, yes and no, because there are still classes of error that could happen anyway. Right? If the client doesn't, yeah, if the client puts in an odd number of bytes, for example, that will cause an error. Yep. Yeah. If it, yeah. My general view, as somebody who's written a lot of DNS parsing code, I'm sure you have too, is that DNS parsing code is very, very used to having to cope with underruns and overruns of the data that arrives in a packet. I mean, I remember actually the particular email you sent, you were actually arguing that, well, if you, if you get rid of this field at the front, then you can fix some alignment issues. And actually, sorry, you can't, because you can't control the alignment of where that packet arrives, where those bytes arrive in the packet. There's all kinds of, yeah, it's so much swings and roundabouts. So um, I, I will I'd say, be happy to go either. Yeah, whatever, as, whatever the group thinks. Uh, as author, I will let you choose, and I won't argue about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I could go either way. I'm slightly concerned about the idea that if we don't specify, yeah, well, should we actually just specify a limit in text to say there shall not be more than four or seven? If we do that, what is that number? For me, the only argument really in favour of having the QT count field is that it does put that technical limit, because there's only a three-bit field, on what's allowed to actually arrive there. But then some people have argued we should allow as many Q-type Q end fields as we want. So it's really, yeah, it could go either way. So I'm eagerly waiting for the download of the page that I can click the button on, but okay. here we are. So Ted Lemon again. Um, I think that uh, independently of this question, we should answer the question, how many Q types are permitted? Because uh, the more Q types that are permitted, the uh, larger the possibility of an ampl amplification attack. That's true. Um, and therefore, 
And we might also consider whether there are some things that we should not allow, uh, some Q types that we should not allow because of the potential for them to be used as an ampl amplification attack. I'm not sure we should, but we should definitely, for example, like keys are pretty big. Um, so I don't know that it's important, but, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth at least considering that. Yeah, interesting idea. I mean, there are other techniques available to mitigate amplification attacks these days, such as DNS cookies. So I'm personally not concerned about that. Um, yeah, how many is too many? I can't answer. I say I picked a three-bit field. It could be a, a two-bit field, so the range is four, uh, no, sorry, three additional Q-types. Um, yeah, how long is a piece of string? I haven't, yeah. yeah, some people said no limit at all. So uh, there's certainly a case for, for at least two additional Q-types, because a, a quad A and HTTPS is a very obvious one. Right, so Ted Lemon again. Uh, if you don't think that there is a potential for an attack here, then I don't see any reason to limit the number. I don't think it's likely that anybody's gonna ask for more than two, but why do we care? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if the, if the general consensus is we don't really care that much, I'm actually quite happy to go for just a, a straight array of two byte values and basically drop both the QTD and well, sorry, drop QTD in favor of a pair of opcodes and uh, drop the count field. Yeah, it could go either way. Uh, Lorenzo Colidi, um, you mentioned DNS passing code. Um, maybe an amusing anecdote, I uh, implemented some DNS passing code in our uh, Android firmware bytecode interpreter, which uh, can't jump backwards and has only two registers. <laughs> and um, and has a limit to the number of instructions it can execute. I was able to do DNS decompression, uh, which is which I thought was kind of a major triumph. But uh, <laughs> so no. But my real question is, um, this stuff is going to hardware offload, and the vendor implementations that we've seen have a variety of interesting behaviors. Um, and what can we do <laughs> to make it so? Your argument is to keep it simpler. Right, so so uh, just as an example, right, correctly. we have an API in Android right now that says basically, if you see something matching one of these names, send this blob. And um, what we're going to do with this is ignore it. Probably we're going to ignore it. And we're going to send the blob and cross our fingers that the extra data won't hurt anyone. But I do wonder maybe we should be thinking about this because MDNS definitely. So uh, just just as a sort of like re just as a, as a structural reason for this. There's flat panel TVs where the CPU is on the same power rails as the as this video display circuitry, and they burn 20 watts to turn on the CPU. And the EU regulations say that you get to burn one watt. And you basically, so they can't turn on the CPU for every MDNS packet. They have to do it in hardware, and the hardware will do what the hardware will do. So yeah, maybe this is even already already too complicated for that. So maybe we should, I don't know. If there's anything yeah. that we can do to, yeah. for example, if we were to like, I, ha I hate to say it, but if we were to say, look, you know, here's what you do to, you, can we hard code more stuff and say, look, this is only for A and quad A, then the hardware get, hardware will get it right more of the time. Now, horrible trade-offs, but yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. The, the point is to make this general purpose enough that it isn't just used for A quad A. Um, yeah, there are other uses outside of yeah, Apple's, was it threads, I think you call it. Um, the, the, the very lightweight stuff. No, I, I do realize that, but sort of any television will be doing this just for, and I agree that it's, it's good to have something flexible, but if the flexibility causes hardware to get it wrong, you actually end up with a worse outcome okay. than you have. Well, yeah, so I think that, that's certainly a strong argument for keeping it simple. And I think, yeah, going for, yeah, emitting those two fields would, yes, in practice, make it slightly simpler. Um, yeah, I'm afraid just on point of principle, I wouldn't support the idea that we're going to yeah. do like hard coded packets because that's just a way to get a system that isn't DNS conformant. No, I, I do understand, especially if this is sort of general purpose. I, I just want to say that the pressures that drive hardware offload do not care about technical correctness. And we've tried that argument and it just has not worked over and over again. So, you know, uh, just sort of like, you know, in terms of like owning the consequences of our actions, we need to consider what might happen if we make something that's, yeah. Well, in simple case, generic. yeah. Well, in a simple case, you know, if your TV doesn't support this option, it just means the client will send two or three packets to get the same data. Or will we'll receive two. Sorry? How will the client know if the TV supports it? Because you'll get the EDNS option back. So basically, because there's an EDNS option, it's transparent to the, <clears throat> yeah. 
So it's going to send me this. Yeah, it's going to send and me the this. the hardware is going to be like, I don't know what this is, but anyway, I saw so, what I wanted. And I'm just so a conformance, any, any conformant DNS server should ignore any DNS option that it does not understand. Okay. Yeah. And because it's ignoring it, the fallback behavior is that it basically acts like any other DNS query. Right. So okay. the client will recognize that the server hasn't understood so the option. So then I do want a number here that says that's greater than one, because the hardware at least can look at the number without having to do the TLD parsing of the, uh, of the types of options that are there, right? Because here's the thing, the only thing that you'll ever get out of hardware is, I'll send you the other records as well, or I'll just send you one, because otherwise you're gonna break. You're not gonna, we're not gonna get any better behavior than these two modes. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think, Lorenzo, you can do what you want, because I, I think maybe the part you're missing is, as Ray says, it's an option, meaning it's completely optional. And if yep. you choose not to implement it, there's no harm. You just ignore it. And uh, this is primarily aimed at unicast queries to what I'd call conventional servers. Yes. If you're doing the multicast DNS query to a smart TV that you're describing, uh, you can simply choose to include additional records that make sense. And in fact, that's what multicast DNS already does. If you query for A or quad A, it gives you both of them because you probably want them and multicast packets are expensive. So let's pack it all into one and use the name compression. So whatever heuristics you want to put on your smart TV to give the records that you know are useful for that use case, you can do that today. This is a way of giving a hint to bind nine or yeah. some similar uh, uh, big iron DNS server. Or even smaller I yeah, but yeah. Yep. Yep. The, the reason we need the hint is that but, but the reason we need the hint is that we have observed our implementations fall over when we send packets without it right we, we need a client side indication that says hey I, I'm willing to understand more than one answer otherwise right otherwise we wouldn't need to define something like this is that correct perhaps I'm misunderstanding the whole thing uh, no um, basically if the server understands it, you'll get back the same eDNS option, well, eDNS option code plus one, because that's how the server indicates. I have, re I have parsed your field, and here are the answers you wanted. If the response does not contain the eDNS option, then that is basically an indication that the server did not support it. I'm thinking we might be the point where it makes sense to, to discuss this privately. Yeah. Um, because this is something that's been discussed, as um, Ray says, for more than a decade in, in, in the DNS community. Yeah. Uh, the reason I came up to the microphone was because you asked a specific question, which is, should we have a limit on the number? And I'm going to say I believe quite strongly there should be. Should I, not. There should be. Oh, should be. Uh, and I'm going to say eight. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as it's more than two or three. The reason I say we should have a limit is it really worries me when we have protocols that don't have defined limits because then when you're trying to test your implementation to know whether it's conformant, there is no reasonable limit on the number of queue types you'd be expected to put in. Somebody could craft a malicious packet, which is 64K long that requests. Well, that, they, they actually can't because the EDNS option length is only an 8-bit field, but yeah. Uh, okay, so that's but, a good but point. But even so, yes, that's, that's, a good that's point. more options than we could ever really, really and, and particularly support. for constrained implementations uh if they've if they need buffers to stage information or whatever actually being able to know how much ram do i need to implement this thing and be compliant yeah, is, is really helpful yeah good point. okay so i think what i'm proposed to the chairs i do on these two points specifically is write off a summary a brief summary of the discussion to the group and where i think what i'm going to propose is we basically drop these two fields. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with Stuart's proposal of a, of a limit of eight options in, in there. I just put that to the working group for a consensus call. That sounds great. And if you know you, Stuart and Lorenzo are free for the break after and you want to chat through the firmware a bit, that could be useful too. Yeah. OK, so <clears throat> last slide. Um, as I say, there is some text already in the GitHub that isn't yet a zero one. I know there's a couple of things that, that I still need to actually add to that. Um, there is an issue with AA bit handling uh, that I need to fix um, because of the weird ways the DNS works. If you talk to an authoritative server and ask, for example, for both the NS records and the DNS records for a zone, 
you actually get a conflict in the AA bit because NS records at the top of the zone or above the zone cut are not authoritative, but the ZS record is authoritative. And likewise, the new proposed DELEG record, which is also a potential use case for this in the future, for um, you could ask for NS plus DELEG in the same query. Um, again, NS records not authoritative, DELEG records are authoritative. So there's a bit of an issue there about how we might resolve that. So I'll be doing some text. Um, but I also mentioned earlier that I've got the uh, QD counters one draft in the NS op, and a lot of the text in the introduction um, of this draft, sorry, of the draft we're discussing now, was written before the QD counters one draft existed and is covered by that draft. So essentially, some of the text we've got will be removed and replaced with a normative reference to RFC to be QD counters one. Um, that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Uh, Ted, you're up. Oh, unless there's any so, other questions. Yeah, unless. So we're. I can't see the queue. Going to get short on time. So okay, since yeah. you know we, as a reminder, we sent a call for agenda items and got crickets. So we have a session of forty-five minutes this time, yeah, of which better. we. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I, it just means you will be able to talk less. I, I'm a. I get paid either way, um, and so we have twenty minutes left. So I'll let you decide how you want to allocate that time. But let's right. focus on the adopted do documents. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So uh, there's actually not. I think we'll be fine. Uh, very quickly, so the SRP service reg registration protocol we've been working on for how many years now? Um, it's basically at the point where um, Eric has threatened to press the publish button. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so all the discussion has been cleared. Uh, the only remaining issue is that um, uh, Paul Vouders um, uh, had a question about uh, the way that we're doing the constrained UDP case and how we're doing source address val validation in that case. And um, it's not clear. I, I, I have a question to him to ask him what he wants us to do because we could probably tighten up the text a bit. Um, there was a proposal made to uh, set the, uh, the hop count, uh, the hop limit um, to prevent off network uh, delivery of, uh, and basically to, to check the hop limit to, to verify that the packet has not been forwarded. Um, we would have to uh, do an update to the draft to account for that. And I just haven't heard back from Paul. So that's where we stand on that one. Um, and, uh, you know, one way to address this would be to not address it now and just address it later when we write a document that talks about how to deal with the case where we have a, a stub router, which is sort of the, the general use case for the UDP ver version of this protocol. If we have a stub router um, that is uh, acting as, or a stub, a stub router that has SRP clients on the far side of it, on the stub network side of it, but the SRP server is on the infrastructure network, like your home router or something, that's one hop. So we need to figure out how we're solving that problem. Um, one way to do it would be sort of DHCP style where we have a relay. So we basically are, you know, <laughs> authenticating each step by restricting it to one hop. Um, but whether we need to solve that in this document or not is an open question. Um, I have a bunch of uh, stuff to the, the, go to the next slide. Um, if anybody wants to comment on this, by the way, please, uh, please do. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, during the IES, review, IESG review, um, we added a number of things. I'm trying to figure out if any of these are important enough to really highlight. Um, if people are really interested, they can look at the disks in the documents or look at the slide. Um, the pre-IESG review version of the document was 22, so it's pretty easy to see the diffs. Um, one thing I'll highlight is that we didn't actually explicitly say that, that updates have to be sequenced. And that creates a problem. Um, an SRP requester could send two updates back to back without waiting for an acknowledgement. And uh, that makes life a lot more complicated. And so the draft now explicitly forbids that, um, which, you know, that's actually a fairly significant change. So that's one thing to be aware of. Um, next slide. Uh, Let's 
Yeah, no, I don't think there's anything else that I really need to call out there. Everything else was relatively minor editorial or just like making things clearer. Um, Everything the AD for this group. So Ted, what Ted just said is important, right? There's been multiple change during the IAG review, more change than usual. So it's up to the working group to decide whether we want to redo and restart from a group last call. So it's basically, I am waiting for one week. If somebody wants to go and redo the working group last call, please tell the chair and we will redo it. Okay. But I think the change are important, but in the good way. So it does not need a new working group last call. Just to be clear. So what I would propose here as chair, assuming that's okay with everyone, is um, as soon as Ted's decided what he wants to do on that last bit, uh, to, and we have a published draft that you're happy with, mm -hmm. then we would let the working group know and give the working group like two weeks. I wouldn't necessarily call it a working group last no, call because no, no, no. I would require a review, whereas here, if two weeks crickets, it passes. And then we'd move forward just to give everyone an opportunity to review, but not to require it like we would do a normal work group last call. Perfect for me. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay. Next slide deck. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, we talked about some updates to the advertising proxy and Prague, and I think maybe even in San Francisco, um, basically the, the draft originally had a very broad scope and covered a bunch of things that don't really have a whole lot to do with the advertising proxy function because they were related. Um, but uh, we concluded that it was better to just explicitly describe, describe the advertising proxy and nothing else um, in this document. And so the document's been updated to do that. I think there's still a bit of work to do. Um, but in fact, I think I have another page about that. The changes, uh, sort of protocol level changes are that we no longer require uh, or even suggest that um, any special behavior occur with respect to conflicts. Uh, if there's a conflict, it just means that, that, that we don't wind up advertising that record. Um, and hopefully it gets resolved later. If not, whatever. It's We're basically being agnostic about that because it turns out that it's it's highly problematic to, to handle conflicts like that. And they generally do not happen um, except in cases that are essentially self-inflicted wounds where, where the conflict is actually between two things that are actually the same thing. And so it was just causing a lot of problems and we weren't getting any benefit out of it. So uh, the additional thing is that we now uh, have, have the, the TSR record as mandatory to implement, which has implications on working group adoption, I think. But um, the reason for that is, again, it addresses the problems that we had with self-inflicted wounds with respect to uh, the same data being advertised by two different advertising proxies. So uh, I think, like I said, so next slide. Uh, so, um, the, I think uh, sort of the next step is that we actually need to implement TSR and see how well that goes and also implement the the letter of the current draft, which we don't currently do. Currently, um, it, at least the Apple implementation, I don't know about OpenThread, um, is really very DNSSD specific. And uh, the advertising proxy is not DNSSD specific. It's basically just here is a DNS zone, advertise it with MDNS. So, uh, I'd like to do that implementation, see what happens before saying that this is done. Um, but I don't know of anything in the draft currently that's a problem there. There is one additional thing that we could do that I think would be really good if it works. And I have also haven't explored this yet is um, use a subdomain for the advertising proxy services, except for the PTR records. Um, since this is a DNSSD, the PTR records are, are how, we, how we find a service. So they need to be at the top level but they can't conflict. So a PTR record that's pointing at, say, you know, in the example here, uh, blasnorf.foo.bar.link0.local is only gonna conflict with another PTR record pointing specifically to that name, which is not a conflict. So, um, so what this would do is basically prevent um, sort of real conflicts with where there's a service being advertised on the network locally with a particular name and there's another service that has the same name that's that's being advertised from a DNS zone using the advertising proxy. So uh, I'd like to explore that. I'm curious if anybody else is, thinks that's a good idea or a terrible idea. Um, I don't know that we have time to go into any detail about it right now. Looks like Abton wants to say something. 
Yes, I, uh, so uh, uh, in from Google, I want to echo what uh, Ted said. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think if we can make that work, that's the right way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the challenge is going to be making sure that the consumers of this data don't do something weird if they get a name that's got multiple labels, basically. <laughs> so exactly. I, I, I know for a fact that the, the multi-label thing does work in terms of just advertising the record. So the only issue is just whether the consumer would fall over for some reason. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, I guess, you know, we'll uh, let you know how the implementation stuff went, hopefully next ITF. Next slide, I think that's it. Yeah, so next deck. Okay, next slide. SRP replication. So um, we haven't actually had a lot of time to work on this. Um, and so uh, we did, uh, Jonathan did an update uh, to address one of the outstanding issues. Um, so he's documented the startup process a little more thoroughly. And, and so the startup process is now documented in a way that's likely to actually work, um, which would be good. Um, but we have a bunch of work left to do on this. So this is still, uh, we just haven't had time to to do all of the stuff that we sort of uh, would like to do to finish this. So not much more to say about it right now. Next deck, unless anybody wants to see no questions. And that was our working group adopted documents. And now we're going into the individual drafts. Yep. Okay, time since received. Uh, next slide. So we talked about time since received before. Um, and in fact, Apple has an implementation of time since received that uh, we have a lot of experience with and uh, the experience has been somewhat painful. Um, and the reason was that we, when we originally did time since received, we thought we were dealing with uh, resolving conflicts. And really what we should have been dealing with is noticing that we have two copies of the same data and one of them is stale. That is to say, not a conflict, but just stale data. Um, and so uh, the new document, um, uh, addresses that. So we now, we now use uh, um, the, uh, the key, basically the DNS key that's used to do the update as a way to distinguish between, um, uh, to notice that, that we have two conflicting data that's not actually in conflict, but just stale. Um, and then we just throw out the older data. Um, so, uh, and, and because we're using the key instead of using like a hash on the message or something like that, um, we don't have to worry about like, you know, disagreements between hashes and stuff like that because um, the key never changes. So next slide. So uh, we were using, we, we originally had the TSR record be a resource record. It's now an EDNS zero option instead. Um, and that's because uh, we want to be able to include it in MDNS packets that we're sending to consumers of the packet that might not implement TSR. And so we don't want to confuse, we don't, basically we don't want the TSR packet, the TSR record to wind up being uh, in, some, in, in some device's cache when it shouldn't be and causing confusion. So, um, so the way we do that is the EDNS zero option has an index into the DNS message. So if you think of the DNS message as having one question and uh, some number of answers and uh, some, some amount of authority data and some amount of additional data. So the first answer is gonna be index zero. The second answer would be index one. Let's say there are only two answers and then the, the authority, the first authority record would be index three and so, uh, two and so forth. Um, so that is how we relay the owner name without either fully representing the owner name in the EDNS zero packet, which would be big or, um, uh, or using compression, which we're not supposed to use for EDNS zero options. So um, we, the, the spec currently uses a key hash, but I think that's too big. I think we can just use a key tag. This is not crypto. It's just, we want to be reasonably sure that we don't have a collision. And as we know from discussions on the DNS op mailing list, the likelihood of collisions is not zero, but quite low. Um, so and on a single subnet, I think it's extremely low. So 
Uh, we can talk about using something a little fancier than a key hash if we think we need to, but uh, I don't think we need to. And so, and then also time since received as in the previous document. Um, and uh, we only do one TSR per owner name because uh, we don't expect to get separate updates with records with the same owner name. So uh, this is a bit SRP specific. That's sort of intentional. Next slide. So uh, I already talked about this. Uh, yeah. Uh, one big win about this new way of doing TSR is that it means that we don't need to do MDNS probes in the advertising proxy when we're just publishing or proxying a record. We know the record is unique. And so we can set the, we can, we can enable the no unique, known unique behavior in RFC 6762, which means we don't have to probe, which means first of all, the registration happens faster or the, 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 um, the advertisement happens faster. And secondly, uh, we don't wind up sending like all of this extra multicast traffic that's essentially spurious, especially if you've got like, if you've got five advertising proxies advertising the same data, that's a lot of multicast traffic. So this really reduces the multicast traffic. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we haven't implemented this yet. So everything that I just said is speculation, um, but we're working on it. Hopefully we'll have an implementation soon. Um, we'll tell you in, what is it, Vancouver? Or yeah, we'll tell you in Vancouver what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and it'd be really cool if other people who have MDNS implementations would be interested in also implementing this and doing some interop testing. So that's it. Um, I think next slide. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so we've got one more. <laughs> we have four minutes unless you uh, need a little extra time. So Dima came up to me um, in Prague, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and um, basically said, you know, we actually need to do something about like additional records. And, and we actually somewhat miscommunicated about this. So he had a slightly different idea in mind than I did, but um, this is what came out of it. So uh, next slide. So did you want to present or did? You... Yeah, it's fine, fine, okay. you, you, you do that. Okay, so next slide. Uh, so, um, DNS push, basically the idea is you subscribe to some name. And if you're doing DNS as D, the name you subscribe to is probably uh, the service name. So like underscore uh, airplay dot underscore TCP dot local, for example. And, uh, and you're going to get updates whenever there's a new record, a new, a new PTR record with that owner name. Um, whenever you get one of those updates, that means you've discovered a new service. Um, and so having discovered a new service, you're now gonna to wanna to go look up all the records associated with that service. That means that you're getting a message from the server and now you're gonna to have to send a couple of messages to the server to subscribe to the individual things that you subscribe to and then you get those back. And so you've got some additional round trips and, and more bookkeeping and stuff like that. So the motivation is to see if we can do something about that. Next slide. So, um, so with MDNS, if you, if you were to do a browse on a particular service, um, the MDNS response that you would get from anybody that's advertising that service would almost certainly include the PTR record, which is the service name, the uh, SRV and text records, which are on the service instance name, and all of the A and quad A records, which are on the host name. Um, and those would all just come to you in the same MDNS packet. And so you wouldn't have to do a second query because you already have all of the answers you need in order to use that service. Um, so, uh, the goal here is to basically give us parity there, uh, that when we ask for, uh, the PTR records that, that list, that, that allow us to browse services, um, we can get back the same sort of data without doing additional queries. Next slide. So, um, 60, RFC 6763 actually recommends in section 12 that we, uh, return additional data. So we actually have a spec that says what additional data we want to return. Um, but DNS push actually forbids that. So, and, and it makes sense, right? Because we need to validate the responses. We want, the, the whole point of that was we don't want to just get random responses and stuff them in our cache. Um, but this is a fairly constrained use, use case. We, I think, can reason about it and we can write code that validates the responses um, that's safe. So, um, 
So the idea here is basically uh, to, to, uh, to replicate the 67, 63 behavior. Um, next slide. So uh, the idea is that we're gonna include a, an additional secondary TLV and that indicates to the push server which additional records to include. Um, and uh, it can limit the number of responses. So there's a couple of different patterns that you might do with browsers. One is, I really wanna know all of the services on the network because of this, of this type because I wanna I want to use, I, I wanna communicate with all of those services. Like if it's a light bulb or something like that, you wanna be able to either tell whether the light bulb is on or not, whatever. You're gonna want all of the information on all the servers. So that's sort of no limit. Uh, another use case is I just want like a printer. I don't care which printer. So then you'd say, just give me one. Um, and there might be cases where you need a couple, but not too many, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So basically we're just proposing to have an explicit numeric limit to how many services get returned. Um, and there's text in the draft about that, which I think is a little bit weak right now. So um, <laughs> I see nods. Uh, so, uh, so we'll work on that, but that's the idea basically. Next slide. Um, so yeah, this, this is the this is the format of the extension. So we'll uh, include a count and a list of our types. Um, and uh, in the document, I'm kind of reaching in the direction of like this sort of weird recursive thing that I'm not sure is actually a good idea. We might actually want to make it a little bit more DNS SD specific, in which case I think we wouldn't need quite as much complexity. So. The second bullet on this slide is talking about all that complexity, which I don't think we have time to get into since we're already over our limit. So next slide. All right, and unfortunately- the koala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are over time, so we won't take questions at the mic, but if folks are interested, please send them to the list, especially as chairs, given that this is new work, we wanna see if people are interested. And even if you don't have questions, you wanna say, hey, I'm interested in implementing this, or I think this is good work, that's super helpful for us. So please discuss this on the list. And of course, questions too, I'm sure Dima and Ted would be happy to answer them. So with that, that's the end of our DNSSD session, and we're switching over to Snack. Thanks so much, and sorry for going over. All right, uh, we do need a note taker for snack. If we have a volunteer in the audience who wants to raise their hand. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, everyone welcome to snack. Uh, Kieran is remote, she's at home, she's on the screen, and uh, uh, she's gonna take us through the chair slides and uh, kick us off for the snack uh, part of this session. Thanks, Taryn. Would you please share the slides? And just one sec. Good afternoon, everyone. So you have like 30 seconds to stretch yourself between DNSSD and Snack. They're at the top, the first slide deck. Yeah. Uh, just getting them shared. Slides. Okay, for some reason. Okay, for some reason I'm not seeing the share on my end. Uh, do you want to go and go ahead and kick that off, uh, Karen, if you can, from your side? Yeah. If you can click Let on them. Me. Sure. Let me try. No, I don't want to share my screen. Uh, 
All right, are these slides visible? Yep, we've got them, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. One more time, uh, this is a joint session with the NSST and uh, thank you very much for pretty much stopping on time. Um, usual note will again for people who might have joined in just for the snack session, uh, just be respectful and stay on the topic and you'll be fine. And I assume you guys are familiar with the ITF policies. Um, in terms of meeting management, we found the note taker. And uh, please make sure you are signing the blue sheets by scanning the QR code. In terms of agenda, we would like to update um, how the work group is progressing from the chair's side. And then we have two drafts that uh, we plan to discuss. Um, with the snack simple document, we will try to take pretty much the same approach that we did last time. And we'll try to pick up the issues and see if we can do some kind of wordsmithing around the paragraphs and improve the text there. So any issues with the agenda? All right. Looks good. OK. So we were pretty busy since 118. We ended up uh, hosting two interim meetings within which we and we resolved like five issues, closed five issues, and we were meeting every two weeks. And you can see the changes that came into the document uh, through this link, and it will show you all that has changed between 118 and now. So we want to keep making the forward progress, and uh, the idea will be right after this meeting, within two weeks, we will start scheduling interim meetings again. And we would like a lot of participation from the work group. So if there is a time zone issue uh, for you, let us know. We will try to accommodate for that. And I've seen that authors are pretty flexible as well. They are quite flexible with the time zone. So let us know if you have certain time zone restrictions and we can make that happen. Um, we are pushing for finishing up the document by next IETF. That means we have 90 days from now. So please look into the document, see if it's implementable, which, with which I mean that can you read the document and uh, translate into code. And uh, we are also considering that can we do some kind of hackathon that could be an open source implementation or it could be an interop between uh, different vendors. So this is something we started talking about it. We will try to brainstorm more about it on the mailing list, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of it. Then um, with respect to stub router RA flag, uh, we are desperately looking to finalize the home for this document, should it be six man or snack working group. So what we have done is um, we have received the initial set of review comments from the snack uh, working group and uh, we will push it to six men for further uh, review comments and see how fast we can get the last call on it. So this document uh, adoption is pretty important to get the IANA uh, stub router bit allocation. So this is that's why we would want to speed this process of adoption pretty fast and wherever we can help six man group and get the reviews from uh, Snack working group that would be great. Did, uh, did you intend to remove the slides? And no. Jen, did you want to come up with a comment? Yeah, uh, just a quick comment. Jen Linkova has uh, six month chairs. Yes, we do have you on the agenda. We'll take a look. As far as I know, last minute suggestions was made I know, yesterday or today mm -hmm. on change of the format of the like uh, option and use another extended like option field 
there, so maybe the text of the draft will need to go through some changes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there is an email thread about that, yeah. But yeah, six men is like definitely would like to take a look and be in charge of allocating that stuff and uh, reviewing the draft. So let me ask you a question. In terms of work group adoption, are you waiting for this change to be uploaded, uh, the new revision for the work group adoption? So my understanding is it was suggestions made like yesterday, today. I, I don't know. We discussed it yesterday, but I don't know when it went to the list. So Eric Mink is the entity for this working group also. I would strongly suggest, Jonathan, the change is very small to do with the change today or tomorrow. Then we can be uh, calling for adoption in six months officially. And the name should then be draft dash we dash six months. So we clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know there are some discussions about submitting new versions of the draft like day before the session, but I think it fully completely justified in that case. Uh, just uh, quickly skimming through the graph as a Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo Clitty, uh, quickly skimming through the draft as a sort of a six month participant. Um, it occurs to me that if I just read it, I would have no idea what this bit means. Um, and it would not, so, so the, the only thing that I would conclude upon reading it would be that I have to read all of ITF Snack Simple to understand what this does. <clears throat> and I think um, it would be helpful in that document to say, Here's what a stub, if, in case you don't want to read these other 50 pages, here's what a stub rooter must and must not do. And here's the promises that it makes. And here's what this bit actually means in terms of like who sends it. What are they committing to? And what are other things that want to send the bit supposed to be committing to? And what can things expect? I think, yes, this is probably is, may or may not be covered in, in the snack draft. But I think also in terms of implementations, having it in one place would be easier. Just a, a note, we do have time for that draft to be discussed specifically after we get through these chair slides. Actually, yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I'll just point out that uh, it actually is good to only specify behavior in one place. And so uh, the behavior of snack, uh, route, of, of stub routers is something that I think should be specified by the snack working group, not by the six man working group. And so we really can't put the text that you're requesting in the RA flag document. The RA flag document's purpose is to allocate the RA flag. It is not to document um, all of the details of how it's used. We do document what its general purpose is, but going into vast detail about it in that document wouldn't really make sense. Um, so that's why we didn't. Um, that, that's not something that, I'm, I mean, we could revisit that, but, but that's why we did it that way. Uh, yeah, so we should take these uh, discussions to the mailing list. And uh, Stuart, you want to go? Um, yeah, listening to this discussion, uh, I, I think I agree with Ted's comment that you don't want the same text repeated in two documents because then there's a risk of it contradicting. Uh, is the answer to combine these two documents rather than just have... Ted's laughing at me, so I'm guessing that was a really stupid <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> to the mic, Ted. Uh, I mean, may maybe from what I'm hearing, it sounds like it's better to have one document that describes both the behavior and the expectations and how the bit is represented. And maybe the two working groups have to cooperate on reviewing that document. But splitting it into two seems like, to Lorenzo's point, somebody reads one document and they shrug and say, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and if the two documents end up cross-referencing each other, then maybe just make them one and save an RFC number. Uh, Lorenzo Khalidi, I, I would like to note that there's some uh, that there's some um, um, interesting text at the end of the six man charter that says if we think six men should review this, we must review this, and um, that's uh, we could basically say okay, then this can just go through snack, and then six man does have the authority to review changes to v six specifications as as part of its charter, and then we would say this go through would go through snack and just has has to go through some sort of six-man review. 
in terms of merging the docs, I mean, yeah, it's true that the doc is very long, but at the end of the day, if I, if, if it's not possible to understand the behavior of this flag as a six man participant, then, you know, they're going to have to read the other one anyway. I think, yes, yeah, so there are pros and cons of both approaches. Lawrence, I understand your concern, but on the other hand, I do not think a six men should be adopting a draft when most of the text is like has nothing to do. Like six men, yeah, would not be able to have. We. So I, I think we've done that before, right? When you, for example, we we making changes like requesting extension. When people talking about extension headers options and extension headers, right? You do not specify the behavior of what the devices do with the data, right? You specify the format, and that's reviewed by six men to ensure that it doesn't break anything, right? So it complies with specifications in general. So I do not see much harm of having a short draft and six men saying here is the flag and behavior specified in this particular document, maybe to address your comment, we might it might be desirable to have a short text saying only those type of devices should care about. No, you should say if you are a host, you do not care, right? Host should ignore this flag. Routers need to look into this document. Router implementer should read this document to find out what they do, and that should save you a lot of time without actually. Uh, as, uh, making the process too complicated. I think we do have Stuart yeah. in the queue next. Um, Bob Hinden, the, one of the other six men chairs. Um, I'm okay with two documents, but it would clearly be very important that they that there be normative references to each other. And yes, we don't want to have text that's different, trying to say the same thing. It, it should at most quote text or should, shouldn't say anything at all. It said, go read this in this document. Yeah, Suresh Krishnan. So, uh, Stuart, were you in front of me? Yeah, okay. we'll remove. How did it get ahead of me? Like, I was like, oh, like Stuart has some special thing. Uh, so, uh, my preference, like, I understand Lorenzo's concern, and I also heard Stuart. I prefer like a single draft that's also reviewed by six man, and I have like existence proof of this, which is the mobile IPv6 spec, which took a bit from the router adjustment, but like, mobile ipv6 working group did the whole thing so there's like no separate document in six man to do it so but like i think six man job would be to actually review it and say is this the right thing to do in an array or not and and i think that can be like you know if somebody can kind of summarize the thing send it over and say hey this is what we're using it for that email could be useful for six man to look at it and say like hey are you using the right tool uh like to do this and that should be done at least that's my view thanks yeah go on no, I, I, yeah, that is because I, I think you know, the one thing to point out is that the text, as, as, as currently written, has a bunch of normative language in it, which are, already causes the possibility of a conflict between this draft, which says stub reader must blah 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 must blah blah blah, right? Which already creates the possibility of a conflict. So I, I, I do agree. The other thing is like you know I think it would be beneficial for six man participants to review the whole of this to make sure that like you know you can't really say whether it's appropriate in the RA unless you understand how it works, right? Eric Ring, uh, in TD. I hate when we want to overdo the process, honestly. Um, there's a simple flag. We have, if you're using the extended flag, we have 48 of it or, or them or 64, I don't remember. Uh, now, you get a point, Lorenzo. The text in the current draft is way too simple to understand the context. This one, this issue needs to be addressed, but it could be in a single draft. My own preference would be to make it this draft in six months uh, with more text, because you, you get the point there. Uh, I heard something interesting there, which I think I do agree with, which is why I came up. Uh, Maybe I said before, make one document, but listening to the comments, maybe we want a document which is for s snack router implementers, which is here's what you need to know. And we need a much shorter document for everybody else saying, this is what you should do with this bit. 
and what one specific thing is hosts should ignore it because it would be an inadvertent own goal if some host vendor says, <clears throat> oh, the snack bit is set, I will ignore this RA as not being relevant, right? Because that's not what we want. So actually writing that down somewhere, I think would be helpful. So you don't need to know what a snack router is, but treat it like a real one, treat the route information options and the prefix information options, treat it as normal. If you see this bit saying explicitly, ignore it doesn't doesn't concern you. I think it is important to write that down. Even if you know nothing else about snack, hosts should, should know that. Oh, Ted. Yeah, so, um, I mean, my reaction to all of this discussion is that if we have a separate document, it actually should say less, not more. Um, because uh, basically the point of this document, the reason that it needs to be reviewed by six man is because we need a bit <laughs> and six man has change control over the bits. Um, the reality is this bit is not, uh, should not be of interest to hosts or routers. The only thing that should ever pay attention to this bit is a stub router. If you are not implementing the stub router specification, you do not need to look at this bit and you shouldn't look at this bit. Um, and so maybe that's the thing to say in the document if we do have two documents, but hmm? because options are bigger than flags. I mean, why, why this, it's like this is a weird conversation of like, you know, we're, we're basically like you know, tying ourselves in knots to do something that's trivially easy, which is just allocate a bit in a header. <laughs> no. Uh, at the what? mic, please, guys. Yeah, so, right, so, uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, and, and, and yeah, to, to, to Stuart's point, I think that, that, in fact, that what, well, so what Eric was saying, not at the mic, by the way, I'm Ted Lemon, in case anybody missed that. <laughs> um, what, what Eric was saying, at, uh, not at the mic, was that um, we, we have behavior that we want for things other than stub routers. And that behavior is don't pay attention to this bit. Um, and uh, maybe not, maybe this is where it needs to be written down. In fact, maybe that's the only thing we need to write down here because it, I think it does make sense to have a document that somebody who's not implementing a stub router has to read if they wanna know what to do about this bit. But to have them have to read the whole stub router document to figure out what to do about this bit seems a bit unkind. So I think there is some value in having the separate document for that reason, but again, it should be really, really short. In fact, I think that, you know, we have a lot of text, which I have up on the slides for us to talk about in a bit, which um, maybe we shouldn't even have in the document, so. Uh, Learn to I'm not gonna express more opinions here. I think we have at least three different opinions in partial conflict, so that that's kind of a, it's kind of a problem because it's just going to slow us down. I would want to propose one way of looking at this, which is this this actually has two questions. It should be should it be one document or two documents? And where should those documents if if two documents should the should the uh, flag document be in six man? So maybe if we split those two questions, it might be easier to answer them separately. I don't know. Stranger things have happened. I do have a proposal. And with the, I would encourage, you know, hey, I would encourage the chairs to see if anyone cannot live with this proposal. So I would, you know, and, and the proposal is as follows. There should be no draft in six man. The draft should be here and it should claim a bit. And six man should be required to review this and should assert its authority to review this. And, the, and some six man experts should go through this draft, understand how it works and say, yes, indeed, this is a good use of a bit. And further, the, the authors of this document should make it easier for said reviewers to execute their sort of, um, you know, like their reviews by uh, consolidating as much as possible the text explaining what this bit means and how it should work in a section that is easier to view. That's a proposal. And, you know, I, I, um, Thank you. I do think it has the virtue of like being roughly as good as any other proposal that anyone could make because this is like not very complicated. So I think we just need a proposal. So the queue, yeah, queue's cut, we have one more. Uh, hello, Mark Smith. I, sp I think the, the broader question, which I think is a sick man's question is, what is the purpose of RAs? Is it to advertise router information to hosts 
or is it for inter-router? And I think this seems to be the first instance of inter-router. I really, I haven't read the draft, but it seems to be inter-router. And then the question becomes whether you're implementing you know, inter-router protocols and should it be carried in our spirit and so on. So. Tim. <laughs> okay. Tim Winters, QA Cafe. The only thing I'm going to say here, having read the six man draft, is you definitely want to make sure that you specify what people should do if they want to ignore the bit. Um, I think it's fine to have two drafts here. I, I, Lorenzo wants to get rid of the one and six man. I don't have super strong feelings about that, but if you keep that draft, you need to tell people to ignore it. Otherwise, CPEs will do bad things. I promise you. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah. Um, clearly, we need some more discussion um, about the adoption of this draft. But keep in mind, we have to make this decision in the next couple of days or so because IANA bit allocation depends on this. So whether you want to consolidate the document or keep two separate documents, we should resolve this quickly. And, and if I, I'll just interject that there was a lot of the conversation that we heard is uh, thank you very much. It was very good. Um, I think we can, I think we can get to that conclusion uh, between the chairs and <laughs> and work to an end to uh, to where this thing will will show up in a couple of days. All right. So the last thing is since we are kind of putting deadlines on our documents that we want them to be ready by the work group by next ITF. So what's next? We promised two deliverables from our charter, Snack Charter perspective. Once we are done with Snack Simple, it's time to move on to multi-link infrastructure network. And uh, since we are hosting interim meetings, we wanted to see if there are volunteers or interested parties who start, who can come up and start talking about the applicability requirement or the problem statement related to multi-infrastructure networks so that we can kind of start this work forward and also get, gauge some energy that we, will we have energy, enough enthusiasm to take this work forward after the next ITF. So it's this topic is also worth some discussion. I don't know if people want to come to the queue and talk about it. Why don't you start, Ted? So, um, yeah, so uh, my reaction to this is I don't have time to work on two documents at once. So <laughs> somebody else wants to work on this document in parallel, that would be great. But I mean, that really would be great. It would be nice if I didn't have to do the second document. Yeah. But um, if nobody else has energy to do that, then it's, I'm not going to be able to work on this until we get the first one done. But you can, if somebody. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, if so, it's a great opportunity for someone to start writing the document or start with something. And I'm hoping that Ted will mentor that person and help them moving forward. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Lorenzo, I mean, what? <laughs> what problem? can we possibly solve that is going to be acceptable in large class of networks? I mean, pretty much the only thing from a, from a rooting perspective, pretty much the only, I feel that pretty much the only possible answer here is just use DHPPD. And, and it's just, I don't see anything else. I mean, like you're not going to speak ISIS or OSPF to an enterprise network, right? So, so do you really have even other, any alternative to DHPPD, for example? Because that's a short document, so like you must do DHPPD. So, uh, Ted Lemon again. So, so I mean, that's a really good point. Um, actually, we already have DHCPv6 PD in the current document. Um, the original, I, I don't, I wouldn't actually describe the advanced scenarios document as a multi-link infra infrastructure document because, as Lorenzo pointed out, we've solved half of the multi-link infrastructure problem already. Um, the difference between Snack Simple and Snack Advanced is, in my mind, is that Snack Advanced um, supports multi-link advertising of services. Um, and, uh, and that requires support from the infrastructure. 
So we're talking, we're still talking. I, personally, I don't think that we care about this for the enterprise. Well, actually maybe we do, but that's an interesting point. So, so yeah, this, this would talk about like, okay, you've got a stub router that you want to configure on your enterprise network and your enterprise network is, you know, maybe there'll be some manual configuration of the router, but maybe there'll be some automatic stuff happening too. That's one case. The other case is you've got a home network that's multi-link and you want to be able to have a central uh, DNSSD server that is updated by devices on a variety of different subnets. Some of them might be stub networks, some of them might just be regular old IP subnets. Um, and some piece of that problem is relevant to Snack. Probably not the whole problem. Um, so then the multi-link advanced scenarios thing, whatever it's called, needs to talk about that, those, how to solve those problems. Uh, and you know, we need to decide which of those problems we need to solve. So this is something we've talked about multiple times in the IETF in the past. It's not really a new topic. Um, the difference between what we did last time I would say, so last time being like home net, um, is we bit off a very, very big slice of the pie. And I think we did not succeed. Um, and so the idea with Snack is let's solve some small problems that get us real meaningful benefit um, and not try to solve every problem. And so to my mind, the big thing that is missing in Snack Simple is multi-link service discovery. And that's what I think is the interesting part of the multi-link infrastructure or advanced scenarios or whatever we call it, document, so. Eric Ring, uh, the NTD. If I remember correctly, when we were chattering the snack, we were simply starting first and only with the simple, but some people wanted to make it more complex uh, with the advanced one. Uh, so we put in the charter a potential extension to have an extended, more complex case, but it was never the plan. And I'm really, really concerned to open this one. If the working group wants to do it, we will do it, right? Don't take me wrong. But I am personally concerned as an individual contributor now that if we start this path, we will end up in open net yeah. Right? This is a real risk here. So in short, uh, I would not mind if we skip completely the advance. As an entity, I would not mind if we skip completely this part of the device. To, 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 Ted's earlier, right? to Ted's earlier point, right? If all we need to do is solve multi-link service discovery, I mean, like, sorry, that's reductive, but you know, if that's the only problem we're trying to solve, shouldn't that just go to DNSSD? Yeah, maybe so. Um, I will say that when we originally chartered Snack, there were a lot of people who were thinking at least that seemed to me to be the discussion at the time. If we actually like manage to get some of this stuff done, then we've actually gotten the camel's nose about halfway under the tent. Maybe we can get the whole camel in. So we'll see. Okay, so um, point taken. We will see how we can scope out the next deliverable or whether it's needed or not. And with that we can move on to the document discussion starting with stub out a bit <laughs> and i'll stop sharing now thanks stub 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 deck. Deck. yeah and um, do you want the clicker sure there's Right. Yep, that should give it to you. So um, an interesting question came up <laughs> as we were discussing the stub router RA option, which is the term stub router actually has um, a variety of meanings. And uh, we have claimed the meaning of the term stub router as if it doesn't have a variety of meanings and that might create confusion. Um, Oh wait, this is not the new version of the document. Um, hmm. All right, let me <laughs> find the latest. So I will tell you what's on the first slide, which is, should we pick a different name? And I suggested a couple of additional names. I know this is like, I, I feel like we're doing a lot of just like talking about stuff that's not really technical and not really important, but I think um, 
confusing people about what what it is that we're referring to when we say stub router is not a good thing. Um, Esco's suggestion was call it an unmanaged stub router, but I don't think that really, first of all, that's a really big name, uh, which I don't like. And secondly, um, I don't think it describes the essential thing that we care about with respect to stub routers. Um, so uh, I proposed uh, some additional names that we could use instead. One of them is sub router. It's very close to stub router, so maybe. Um, the idea is basically it's a dependent router. Like it's not, it's not a router that's connecting networks to each other. It's a router that's connect. Well, it's it's not a router that is um, connecting a through network to another through network. It's a router that's connecting a through network to a network that is not a through network, a stub network. So sub router might be a term we could use. Um, I think stub network is okay because that's actually, we are talking about the same thing that everybody else is talking about when we say stub network, but sub router. Another thing we could call it is a dependent router, same deal. Um, and so, uh, just one I've done. Hmm? Yeah, I'm still looking for the newer slides. So uh, if you can go off these I'm, ones. Uh... Maybe I just didn't update them. But anyway, the point is we need to, we need to have that conversation reasonably soon because, um, we need to resolve ESCO's comment. <laughs> and uh, Lorenzo. Clarifying question. Do you mean like, do you mean that if I have a router and I'm, I mean, I thread router or some other thing that provides access to a network behind me and depending on whether I use prefix delegation or not, I am or am not a stub router? No. Okay. So then maybe no. that slide is just confusing. Then. Okay. No. So the, I the, am a stub router because. You're a stub router. So what we mean by a stub router in the context of Snack specifically is a router that is connecting a stub network to an infrastructure network um, essentially opportunistically, like, like you just plug it in and it works. There isn't some management process you have to go through to make it work. And it's essentially intended to handle sort of uh, home network and maybe Soho network use cases more so than uh, enterprise use cases where uh, you kind of expect there to be some management process or, you know, some, some, uh, you know, yeah. So basically we expect, we expect the network operator to be in control of the router rather than the router just opportunistically connecting on its own. So, um, anyway, uh, I will go through the presentation. So this is the presentation that I prepared for, for six man, just so you guys know. Um, so Everybody here, I'm sure, already knows that a stub router is an unmanaged self-configuring router, especially since I just said so. Um, and uh, its goal is to provide routing to a stub network, like Thread or you know any sort of uh, uh, constrained network, or it doesn't have to be a constrained network. Um, it could just be a home router plugged into a network that's another home router is plugged into. We want actual routing and not not a double net. Um, so. Uh, the main use case, constrained networks. Um, and uh, so you can have devices that, um, I'm not actually sure. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So you can have devices uh, that uh, route to stub networks, uh, things that are called stub networks globally, like you know the general use of the term that are not stub routers because they're not doing this sort of op opportunistic connect to infrastructure thing. Um, so uh, let's see. I need to work on that slide for the next meeting, I think. Uh, it's not working. Here we go. OK, so why do we need an RA flag? Um, so stub routers route between stub and infrastructure. Um, we have to have IPv6 because we need the RA. That's the only way we can actually establish routing. Um, and uh, there isn't an equivalent RA in IPv4 unless you count, like, what was that protocol we used to use? Anyway, nobody implements it anymore. Um, <laughs> sorry. RIP. That's it. RIP. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, hmm? Anyway, so, um, so we have to do this whether infrastructure provides IPv6 or not, right? Like, we need IPv6 to do the routing, but maybe there isn't any IPv6 on the infrastructure that we're connecting the stub router to. In that case, we have to provide addressing. But if the infrastructure does provide 
IPv6, we don't want to provide addressing. So we need to have some way of distinguishing between stub routers and other routers so that we know whether, you know, we know basically what's being provided on the infrastructure. So, um, and we need to notice particularly like, like normally, like if the, when we originally did this, we just said the stub router advertises an RA if there isn't an RA present. Like if we do router solicitation, we don't get an answer back. Okay, we'll publish a route or we'll publish a, a, a prefix. Um, the problem with that is that um, uh, you can get into race conditions where you wind up with two stub routers that each think the other one is the infrastructure router. And so they're, they're basically round robin deprecating each other's prefixes and that doesn't work. So we wanted to be able to very clearly indicate whether or not we're a stub router so that, so that when another stub router sees our RA, it doesn't think, oh, that's the infrastructure router. I'll turn off my, my, my RA. <laughs> so, um, so there's a little, wow, this thing is, maybe I'm pointing it the wrong way. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the two cases where we really need this bit are the infrastructure versus stub prefix thing that I just described. Um, just so that we can tell the difference between an RA that a stub router sent and an RA that the infrastructure router sent. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Is it forbidden for the infrastructure router to also be a stub router and announce a prefix for the purpose only of stub network communication? If the infrastructure, that's a really good question. Um, and it's, it's actually a, a something that we'll talk about in the, um, in the stub, in the stub router as a snack simple document later. Um, the answer is if you are, the infrastructure router, then yes, you're routing, you're, you're a stub router in the sense that I said on the first slide, but you're not a stub router in the sense of snack. Um, so, so you would be, you're, you're the, if you're the infrastructure router, then you're in charge of addressing on the infrastructure network. And so it doesn't make sense for you to set the stub router well, bit. But that network might not have IPv6, for example. If I'm, a, if I'm a CP and like a normal home router with a fiber connection, right, I'm always there there is basically, or if I'm the Wi-Fi access point, there's no networking without me. So mm -hmm. why wouldn't I say, okay, you know, I also support being a stub router. There's no V6 on the upstream, but I'm just gonna send an RA with, with S, well, whatever, what's, what's the flag? Mm -hmm. S equals one. And by the way, you know, if you wanna use this, uh, this is a stub prefix that everyone can use because it, it's useful, it seems useful to centralize this function. Now, Snack is coming along with, you know, none of this stuff is deployed. So, you know, this doesn't exist, but in the future, it would be nice to, uh, to avoid this, like, you know, stub is finding out about each other by just having a centralized function that's always there that does that. So, right. So uh, like if, if we did do it that way, should we set the flag or not? I don't know, but that's an interesting. Question. Well, so, so that's, that's actually a slightly separate question because what you're really talking about there is you've got potentially two home routers connected to the same link, <clears throat> either of which could advertise a ULA prefix that's essentially a stub prefix just so you can do IPv6 on the network, right? But maybe one of them has a connection to an ISP. And in that case, yeah, that's a really good point. You, you might wanna be able to do something similar to this where you don't have to have both routers advertising um, a ULA prefix because why, you don't need two ULA prefixes, right? Because <coughs> right now, like if you install OpenWRT and you don't, explicitly turn off IPv6, even if you don't have an IPv6 uplink, you still get a ULA prefix. Right, and, and it's not just a question of open WRT. I think this is like, that might be mandated in 7084, right? Yeah, like I think if, you're right. Right, so, so yeah, so then like, kind of like in many cases, there's already, I mean, I guess we just need to consider this. So so basically we're, that's, that's, that is out of scope for snack, I think is the main point, right? Like, like you might be right, but whether we actually need to have something like that is kind of orthogonal to this whole question. This, this is strictly about stub routers. And I think trying to do that with the infrastructure router would probably cause more harm than good. If we need something like that, we probably need another bit. So. Yeah, uh, sorry, Krishna. So like Lorenzo, it helped me at least conceptually. I'm just gonna throw how I understand this. So like maybe it helps you with the infrastructure out a bit. So it's, I see it as very similar to the neighbor advertisement overhead bit, just the opposite of it. So like, you know, you're saying like, if you're a stub router, like don't get it or something because I said so, right? I think that's really the, it's like a O bit set to zero. That's how I thought about it. It kind of makes sense consistently if you think it that way. Hi, this is Priyanka. I just had a question regarding what you consider as a stub network. Would you also consider multi-hop large mayonnaise uh, 
on this side and the infrastructure, wired infrastructure on the other side also? This side has a stub, a stub network? Uh, no, so stub networks, in, at least from the snack perspective, are always a single hop. hop. Just a sing, basically a single, a single, a single broadcast domain. So Suresh, you're basically saying that the stub router is a is their RA provider of last resort. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. That would be very helpful to to state it that way. I think yeah. because it, it clarifies a lot of yeah a lot of what we're trying to do. And basically, right. yeah, I mean, yeah. As we talk about this, I'm wondering if there actually isn't a an actual six man problem here, but. I digress. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, and this is why I think there might, now that I think about it, there might be an actual six man problem because so there's this M and O bit consistency thing in the neighbor discovery uh, document where uh, it's supposed to be the case that all of the routers on the link uh, consistently advertise the same M and O bits because we don't want to be we don't want to have like alternating RAs coming out from two different routers on the same link that disagree about whether the link, whether the link is managed and whether the link, well, you know, basically whether you, whether you can use DHCP. Stuart? Um, Priyanka just asked a question and I think we may have given the wrong answer. I mean, oh. I mean, maybe I'm being a bit pedantic, but uh, if I understood right, Priyanka, Priyanka was asking, can a stub network be multiple hops? And we said, no, <laughs> but a thread mesh kind of is multiple hops. So I think it depends how you count the hops. Well, okay. <laughs> That's a good point. It's it's a single it's a single layer it's a single layer two, right? Like it might be a it might be a layer two mesh. And then there would be multiple layer two hops. But thread is not a multi-link layer three network. Okay. So. Mm, right. Yes. Yeah. Single prefix. Yeah, Eric said the right thing. Single prefix right. that, that we're clear on. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so so the other issue that we the, the other reason that we need the uh, the stub router bit is to um, get our M and O bit behavior correct. A stub router basically should not be overriding whatever the infrastructure router is advertising. So when we see an RA from a router that does not have the stub router bit set, that's got the M and O bits that we should be including in our RAs, right? Because we're not going to change the M and O bits. Um, and so that creates some complexity. Um, it's not bad complexity, but the point is, if we see M and O bits set in the infrastructure router advertisement, then we want to persist those M and O bits for a while um, when in our RAs that we send out as a stub router. If we see M and O bits in another stub router advertisement, we probably want to also send the M and O bits, but we don't want to persist them. So in other words, because we just saw an advertisement that set the M and O bits a particular way that was, that was from a stub router, we'll set them the same way. But if we later see um, different M and O bits from infrastructure, we're gonna prefer those. And um, presumably the stub router that, that is reflecting the old MNO bits that it saw in an RA a long time ago, maybe, uh, will continue to persist those until it times out, at which point they will go back to the default state, which is probably off. Ah, Eric Coyne. Uh, sorry for not having followed uh, things terribly closely. Uh, and I thought I had maybe brought this up at some point in the past, but, uh, and, and I know you want to save uh, bits where you can, but is this not what a PVD option is for? I, I mean, this is absolutely not what PVD option is for. It is. It's its, it's, its own. It, it's, it's, it's its own sort of domain. You you only want things that understand the PVD to actually no. process it. You want things no. to be ignored otherwise. No. <laughs> no. No. So. No, it does not. It does not. Yeah, it, so, only if you want to do the bootstrapping to the other stuff. It doesn't, doesn't so, require DNS access or internet access. It's just defining a consistent set of configuration information for using the network. That's what. Uh, so so I'm, I'm just going to suggest something but in the anyway, interest of time. Yeah. If you think that's a solution, maybe we should take that to the list and and describe that. Yeah, yeah I, I'm willing to so just to accept his answer. Just okay. just just to just to just to, to to slightly answer your question. Bear in mind that the consumer of these RAs is hosts, right? And it's hosts that we don't expect to have special software on them. So the stub router RA is just an RA. 
the only purpose for the stub router bit is to tell other stub routers that this RA came from a stub router. That's it. That's all it's for. It's not doing anything special. It's not, there's not a special provisioning domain. It's just the signal to other stub routers. And if we try to make it more than that, we're going to be very, very sad. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, Sarish Krishnan. So, I think you're overthinking this a bit, Ted, right? Like for the MNO bit, right? Yeah. So, um, I'll tell you at least my point of view. Like, if you have multiple routers on the link, if they advertise different MNO bits, you have a configuration problem. It's a configuration right. error. You don't need to address it. Okay. That's the first thing. So, like, don't consider the condition at all. No, 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 hold on. Yeah, hold on, hold on. That's the first bit, right? The second one is even if you don't want to persist, and even if you say the stub bit, the hosts are not going to understand it, right? Because you're not, they're not looking at the stub bit. So, like, if, if they're flagging, they're like still going to go up and down. You're, and, yeah, no, you're right? not understanding what we're doing with it, with this. No, it says like don't want to persist the MNO bit. No, no. You're, what? You're, so what you just said is not what we're doing. Okay. We're not trying to signal to the host how to treat the MNO bits. We're signaling to other stub routers. routers how to treat the MNO bits. The host is supposed to ignore this. Bit. Like, I am not authoritative. I'm a stub. Yeah. Yeah. Don't listen to this. Exactly. Okay. Well, okay. it's no, it's I mean it's other stub routers. I'm also a stub router. Don't listen to me. Sort of. But it's not even that because we're, it, as you said, Suresh, it is a configuration error for us to send different MNO bits than the other routers on the net. Correct. And so we have this sequence of time over which RAs have been sent, some of which will be infrastructure RAs and some of which will be stub router RAs. Correct. Um, and a, a, any particular stub router that's connected to the network may or may not have ever seen an RA from a from an infrastructure when the time comes for it to send its first RA. I so, still understood, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's, it's probably gonna have gotten an answer when it sent out the, the router solicit. And that answer may have come from another stub router. And the stub router that it got the answer from is copying the MNO bits from an RA that it got from an infrastructure router ages ago. Correct. Right? I, I, I understand all this, but I'm just seeing, um, if you see a stub router bit set, right? I'm not going to get any information out of it other than ignore the stuff that's coming out of it and not copy it, right? No, no, that's not what we're saying. Okay, like th then I'm confused because like that's how I understood the okay. sub bit saying like if your sub router gets a RA with a sub router bit set, I'm not going to take that as authoritative, right? That's no, you're not going to take it as authoritative, correct. but you still have to reflect it. You're okay. just treating it differently, right? Okay. The, so, so, so if I've seen an advertisement from from an infrastructure router within some time limit that had the MNO bits set a particular way, mm -hmm. then I'm going to reflect those MNO bits. Now another stub router comes along for whatever reason the infrastructure router isn't advertising isn't answering the router solicit at this moment, so we don't see the answer from the from that infrastructure router. Mm -hmm. We do see an answer from a stub router. We're going to copy the bits from the stub router. The difference is the lifetime on those bits is basically like if I now see another advertisement from that stuff route, stub router, it's not going to, I'm not going to re retain it. Okay. I, I understand so. what you're saying. I, it's not in the draft, right? Like, so uh, I think it's probably like, you know, something you need to do, but I have concerns with that. I'll probably write an email about it because like yeah. uh, I didn't no, get that from the there's, draft. There's an issue. There's an issue in the issue track. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> Lorenzo well, Crudy, it so, um, given the complexities that you've just described, it seems prudent to say that hosts must not, uh, if it's, if they hosts that have been upgraded to understand the specification, must not look at the MNO bits from a stub, and at least you know ten years from now the problem will be solved. Uh, so it it seems prudent. I'm not saying it is a solution, but we do still need this sort of like. Uh, weird, like, you know, time-based stuff, but it would be a lot better to say, look, you know, if I'm a stub, because the problem, the reason why I actually you raised it, I, I think I was the one that raised this problem in, in, in originally, the problem is that you can't not say anything about MNO, everything else in the RA, you can, you can basically decline to state, but the MNO bits are there right. and the root of lifetime is there, but, but, but that's always here. But even if you, even if you say that the stub router bit says, ignore the MNO bits in this RA, what are the value of the what? What if you haven't seen any other RAs? What's the value of the MNO bits? They're undefined. Okay, zero. You see the problem? No, but like it, the MNO bits are, are about infrastructure that exists. Right. So if you don't see any RA, then you assume that they're nonsense. So, yeah. 
So uh, just to cut the line on that, Ted, I think there is text in the current draft, right, that describes the, yes. the use of those M&O bits, and it's uh, it'd be great to if everyone's very familiar with that. Yeah. Um, Hi, Mark Smith. From an ISP perspective with delegated prefixes, et cetera, simple mm -hmm. C the single CPU is common. I generally think of these sub routers more like edge routers, and downstream of that, whatever the MO bits are, whatever people do with the slash 48 is up to them. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a black box. So... Be, and I appreciate that yeah. that does sort of fit in the, the stub definition, yeah. but I also do see this issue as well once it's right. two. Yeah. Um, but, but then they, it's like, well, up to them what they set their MO, MNO bits to. It's not, yeah. my, it's not my position to say how they do it on their own network. To me, it's the edge. Yeah, it's, it's just a packet it's, source. This actually goes back to the point that we were talking about, Lorenzo was talking about earlier, which is what if you've got two ISP routers connected to the same yeah. link? I do. Right? Yeah. So this is exactly. So 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 are the ISP routers tracking each other as MO bits? Yeah. According to the spec, they should be. Yeah, yeah. And then there's <laughs> but there's other bits with yeah in, in RFCs to say yeah. just combine the two together and yeah. The M and O bits are like the evilest thing ever. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> Stuart. I'm wondering if uh, next time in Vancouver we should probably start off with like a, like a 10 minute reminder of what we're working on here. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because um, I, I'm thinking a bunch of people with the best intention are, are coming to help, but maybe don't know all the background. This is, this is uh, a very fair point. And um, the, the background is, as I recall it, I hope I'm gonna get this right now, but, uh, and I'm gonna be talking at the IAB meeting on Wednesday about Thread, which is, part of the genesis of this, uh, we, people do home automation with Zigbee and Z-Wave and other things. Uh, Thread is different because it's an IPv6 technology and as internet people, Ted and I were predisposed to like that. And, and we thought this is great because you can mix and match Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Thread, anything that carries IP packets, the application is the same. I think everybody in the room knows the benefit of that. And then we went down this path of what do we need to do to make this work without sysadmins configuring things by hand because you have to sell products to end users who are going to put them in the home and you don't know what they have in their home or what their ISP might provide. So we thought this would be fairly easy and as many things are, turned out to be not quite as easy but not too bad. I think we're making good progress. Uh, so. So the idea is you you put this device in, which is a thread border router, and it uses IPv6 routing. It's not NAT, it's not an application layer gateway. We, we thought, we believe in IPv6 and routing, so we're gonna do it that way. And we can use all this wonderful stuff that V6 has that V4 doesn't, like router advertisements and route information options and prefix information options. And in principle, all the toolbox was there for us to do what we wanted. There were some bugs in iOS and, and Android that had to be fixed because it had not really been tried in that way. So, so that's what we're doing here. And the, the challenge here is the customer has an ISP that doesn't support V6. Their home gateway is not doing DHCP V6 or router advertisements, but they want to use HomeKit or Matter, which uses V6 across multiple prefixes through the router or through multiple routers. So on day one, the user installs their little globe and it says, uh-oh, I see no V6 here at all. It's all down to me. I have to basically make a, uh, a not just a V6 network, two V6 networks and route them together here. So it does router advertisements on the Wi-Fi side, it does the equivalent on the thread side, it add, picks a random ULA prefix for the Wi-Fi network and a different one for the thread network. It advertises route information options to tell the Wi-Fi clients, hey, if you want to reach this prefix, go through me because I can reach the other network. And it, and that, that part works amazingly. We've been shipping that for like three, four years now. And yeah, you drop this little ball on Paraton and now you've got working V6. Uh, where, where we're hitting now is we went from customers having no thread border routers that was a problem to them buying one to now they have an Apple HomePod and an Apple TV and another HomePod and a Google 
Home Hub Max and an Amazon Echo. And now they've got, suddenly they have lots of border routers. So, so we've got a different problem. And then you get this situation where all these border routers don't know the things they're talking to or also thread border routers, doesn't know that they're stub routers. Um, and then your ISP ships you a firmware update and offers V6 service. Well, we want all these border routers that have been sort of in this little echo chamber repeating what they heard each other say to go, oh, like the big boy's in town now. He's a real V6 router. He knows what he's talking about. We should start listening to him. And that is my summary of what this bit is about to say that we're kind of second class citizens, right? We'll do the best to run a IPv6 network here. But if somebody comes along who knows more than we do, we should all listen to that thing, not to ourselves. Sorry. Very well said, Stuart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think, I mean, this has been, a, I, I may have expressed a little bit of frustration up here, but this has been a useful discussion. So, so I apologize for the, uh, the frustration that may have come out. Um, this is, uh, this has been a good discussion. So, um, so I think we've covered the MNO bits pretty thoroughly. Wow. Oh, you know, just a second. Yeah, Eric, gotta... quickly on the yeah. MAO bit. I pasted a couple of texts from RFC 4861 in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem so dramatic to have inconsistencies. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the reality is at this point, hosts pretty much need to deal with inconsistencies anyway for the, you know. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think we've, we've uh, clearly got some thinking to do about how we're gonna proceed with this. Um, I, I don't feel strongly about having two documents. Um, the reason we originally started to have two documents was because that seemed like it was the right thing to do from a process perspective. So I'm perfectly happy to do one document um, if we do do one document, I think it's going to be a little challenging for people who aren't implementing stub routers to get the information they need without bogging down in information they don't need. So to me, that's the argument for two documents at this point. Um, I will say um, the question of whether to use the RA flags option or whether to use one of the existing RA flags did come up at the beginning of this conversation. Um, when we issued the version of the document that we just issued, we had made an explicit decision that we were gonna leave that decision up to six man. And that means that um, we just put in what we want, which is a flag bit, and it's up to six man to tell us you know, what to do. And I feel like that should be a consensus thing at six man, not just a directive um, personally, but you know, we don't have a strong investment in, in how that comes out. Uh, I, I got the sense that there was a feeling that there needed to be some rush about deciding this. And so we should get the document exactly the way it should be before submitting it to six man. A, given the conversation we just had, it's not clear to me that we're in that big of a rush because we need to actually make some decisions. So I don't think we're gonna make those decisions prior to the six man meeting. I think it's still worth presenting this in the six man meeting and I'm probably gonna update the slides based on what Stuart just said because I think that was a much better way to present this. Um, so I think we, we will want to talk about this in six man uh, and I'll also summarize like, you know, all the controversy that occurred here. Um, and uh, that's it. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Thanks, everybody. Uh, maybe we want to take a, a breath. We've only got uh, 12 minutes left in our session. Um, we are going, to, so I want to just say thank you for everyone who's come up to the mic and expressed uh, concerns and opinions and thoughts. Um, yeah, certainly from the chair's point of view, I think this has been a valuable discussion to have in this group. Um, so we've got 12 minutes. Uh, we will, the next part of our, our uh, meeting, uh, we intended to be doing you know, going through issues uh, and doing live updates, live editing of that. Um, let's take, uh, I'll just, let's say 30 seconds here and, and 
think is is there is there anything we could come up with? Is there any of the open issues that we should be tackling uh, next or or first in the limited amount of time that we have? So um, I don't know if you saw this go by, but I did actually update a couple of two of the issues, and I think I put in a pull request on one of them. Okay. So we could talk about that if that seems productive. I mean, we that seems a like time. a productive uh, use of our time, and we can close those perhaps and or move them along a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So um, how are we going to do that? Uh, we will share the open issue and conversation. Sounds good. So just go to GitHub then. Yeah. Let's see. How Ted, would you like to drive that or want me to bring it up or Kieran to bring uh, it up? I'm not in the meeting room, so it's probably oh. faster for you to do it. Yeah. We'll race. Okay. Yeah, come on up. How does this look? Kieran wins. It's a little bit of an eye chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 yeah, okay, that's starting to be legible. I think I can. Which one would you like good. to? So uh, the issue there's there's two issues. One is that 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 I worked on today. One of them is the taxonomy issue. Um, so and the other one is the uh, the issue that you'd opened a while back. So let's look at yeah. So so the taxonomy issue is basically we had had a conversation at this point probably two IETFs ago about um, whether snack should be considered harmful and prevented basically was the uh, contention of, of the person who raised this. And so we actually went through and tried to do an analysis of what scenarios SNAC might be configured in and whether any of those were problematic. Um, and of course, you know, uh, through the, the heavy use of, of motivated reasoning, we came to the conclusion that, that there are no such problems. Um, but, uh, but the value of the exercise is that we made a list of cases, and then uh, if somebody wants to come along and say no, there really is a problem, then they need to add an they need to add an entry to the list or point out why we were wrong about one of the entries that's already on the list. So this is um, ESCO's summary, but we can actually look at the pull request <coughs> if, if that would be helpful. Uh, so there's only one pull request open, Kieran, and that's the pull request that I'm talking about. I need to go, okay. This yeah, if you, just, if you just click on pull requests and then just yeah, open that, that one up and then click on files changed. Yikes. This files, okay. Okay, so, ooh, side by side. Um, all right, so uh, we probably, it's probably not that helpful to have a side-by-side -side comparison here. It's probably better to just show the uh, inline because I just added a bunch of text. It's not really a change from one thing to another. Just on the little gear button. This is assuming that I actually pushed the right change. That's pretty weird. Maybe I didn't push the right change. Yeah, that's weird. Sorry, uh, I guess we can't really review this one because I seem to have screwed up. Sorry. Yeah. No, this is, unless, unless there's more changes down below. There's a large chunk down below, yeah. Oh, is there? Yeah, so keep scrolling down, Kieran. These changes are not the change. Keep going. 
There we go. Okay, so basically I just added this. Um, and uh, so it's an analysis of deployment scenarios in which a stub router could cause problems. And uh, I went through the list of use cases that were raised on the mailing list a couple of ITFs ago. So the first case is the unmanaged home network, which is actually our target market. And so the conclusion that I drew there is that we don't have an issue because the whole point of this is to address that use case. Um, the second use case is a properly managed network, by which we mean a network where the network operator intentionally does not want random devices connecting to the network and advertising routes, router advertisements, that is. Um, and in that case, they have configured RA guard on their network, which is blocking spurious RAs. And so what that means is that if you connect a stub router to this network, it's not going to work. Um, it's also not going to cause any harm. Tim. You're okay with that not working? Because somebody asked for RA guard on 7084 biz. And that was... should definitely not happen. Okay, we should talk about this. Yeah, no. Somebody asked me for that and my eyebrows went up. Yeah, no, like... RA guard explicitly is for managed networks. You have to enable it explicitly. Okay, we should, we should, we're gonna put some text in 7084 yeah. because this is gonna go sideways real quick. Yeah, no, you, so... you cannot have RA guard on. Okay, I, I, I hadn't, it's not in there now, but I did get the request yesterday. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I think it would be good to add some text that says, don't put RA guard. I will, I will add that text. Yeah. All right, you could have a click box that turns it on. It just shouldn't be on by default. So Eric Vainkier, as a Cisco guy, we do not implement RA guard on switch by default for the exact same reason. Right, yeah. Well, wow, this is a hot topic. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything we can do about this, but... Um... Uh, I mean, I, I, our corporate network has RA guard, but sometimes these RAs just like happen to be received. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there's anything that we want to do about that in the sense that probably our yard implementations aren't perfect. Do we want to think about like how to set these lifetimes to sort of limit the extent of the damage? Maybe there's really nothing we can do. I, I don't above. think that there's actually damage. I think it's just like, you know, you get an extra address. Like what's what what act the the reason to do this is not really to prevent harm so much as as it is to prevent weirdness. Um, so it's possible that if the RA if the RA leaks through, but um, host to host um, communication is otherwise prohibited by using the Wi-Fi wireless network isolation, then you get an address that doesn't work. Um, yeah. It is a bug in the RA guard implementation. Not sure if we should say anything about it. Yeah, it, it doesn't really feel like that's our fault. <laughs> um, now, uh, the other question that uh, was raised is, do we actually want it to work in this case? And one other answer to that is that if your network is actually providing prefix delegation, and I think we cover this in the next item here, if if PD per host is enabled, you don't actually really need to send RAs anymore because in principle, the routing is, is gonna work. So uh, so then you can turn on RA guard and your stub router will still work as long as PD is supported and as long as it's routed correctly. Uh, sorry, I just want to follow up on what Lorenzo said because I realized it's actually will be harmful, you know why? Because if I have a device which got your RA with a prefix. And it was exactly the moment when device decided to enable a CLAT. Guess which address will be used for CLAT in this case? Hmm. And guess how well your communication to before the destination is gonna work. So it will be actually harmful in some race conditions scenarios. So I don't think we can claim that just advertising a random prefix. We, we, we're trying to address this in CLAT draft and V6Ops, but current implementations will be badly broken. Okay. I mean, it seems to me that, that, that the, the way that this should be addressed is by having RA guard configured on your network that works correctly. But, because I mean, even if, even if stub routers aren't doing this, somebody, if somebody wanted to deliberately attack your network, it would be very easy to do it by sending RAs. So if you don't have a working RA guard implementation, so you're yeah. vulnerable to this. It's not our. It's not really our problem. I was just actually uh, addressing the comments that if we leak 
like yep. an array, no, no, right? That. Yeah, like so there are scenarios when yeah. leak an array with additional prefixes actually. Right. Maybe yeah, so it would be, it'd be worth, if you wouldn't mind, maybe sending a note uh, or adding that to the, to the issue so that we can track this. And we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. boom, we boom. got through yeah. two sections. Uh, yeah, so that pull request is up uh, right now. If anyone has thoughts on it, burning desires to say anything on it, please furiously type into the uh, comments on the pull request and review it. And I will, uh, that would uh, be fantastic. I'll fix the weird like text changes that were not, <laughs> were not intended. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for the you know the exciting conversation. Uh, I am very glad that it uh, that it happened and, and we were able to have that here. Uh, we didn't necessarily get through uh, things to the our, our our pull requests and our issues as we thought we were going to, but uh, we had some really important discussion. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. We will see you. Well, many of us in a couple of weeks in the next interim meeting. Kieran, did you want to say anything? Well, it was a great meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.